For today, oops. So for today's morning talk, I was going to introduce um, her insight works in this part of meditation which I've been talking about. Uh, it's not that uh, the meditations which lead to stillness totally neglect or hopefully um, just hide <coughs> the factors of insight, it's all part of the one path. When Ajahn Chah would be asked about samatha vipassana, samatha meaning peace, stillness, calm, and uh, vipassana referring to insight, he would again use whatever uh, visual aids he had, which was usually his hand, and you would say, now you see the front of my hand, now you see the back of my hand. You don't see both together. Even though you can only see the back of my hand, the front is still there. Just you know, a couple of, half an inch behind. Now you see the front of my hand, the back of the hand is always there too. Only just a couple of uh, centimetres behind. Just like Samatha Vipassana, calm and insight, they all uh, go together. You cannot split them. It's not as if one is um, separate. You could practice Samatha and avoid insight. You cannot avoid, ins you cannot practice insight and avoid Samatha. They have to go together. <coughs> However, that is not much of a simile. So over the years, I've developed the story of the, the couple, Sam and Vi. They were a couple, and of course, the full name was Sam Atta, and Vi Passima, his partner. But not just Sam and Vi, they also had two dogs. One dog was called Meta, and the other one was called Anapana. So one afternoon after lunch, Sam and Vi decided to go on a walk up Meditation Mountain. Sam wanted to go up there because it was so peaceful, so still up in top of Meditation Mountain. Vi wanted to go up there because she was a photographer and she had this amazing just and not one of these um, iPhone cameras, are really expensive Canon camera, whatever you can catch amazing photographs. And <coughs> she wanted to go up there for the great views, the great insights. Meta, the dog, wiser than everybody, she just wanted to go up there for fun. <laughs> and Anapana just tagged along. So Seth. Sam and Vi and their two dogs, Meta and Anapana, went up Meditation Mountain after lunch. When they got even only halfway up Meditation Mountain, it was so still. Wow, I could hear the people. It was amazingly peaceful. And Sam was just enjoying the great energy which stillness gives you. Wow, no stress. Couldn't even think because it's so, so peaceful. But he also had a pair of eyes and he could enjoy the view. Why? His partner, she was taking this incredible photograph. She could see it was almost over the whole world from hardly even halfway up. But she also paused every now and again from clicking the shutter to experience the invigorating. Amazing peace, even halfway up. As a matter of the dog, she was wagging her tail. The more and more she went up, the more and more she was wagging her tail. The more peace, the more view, 
the more happy she was. She was pissing out. And as for Anna Pahana, she was actually fading away. <laughs> and, when, and when they got to the top of meditation mountain, wow, that the whole world had stopped and paused and frozen. Nothing was moving there. And the bliss, all oh, sandwiches enjoying everything. But also he had his eyes open. He could see the whole of Samsara spread around him. Wow. As for Vi, as quietly as she could, she took the photographs. The great insights. Three times she clicked her camera and each other took her and at her. And as for uh, Meta the dog, have you ever seen when a dog is really happy? <laughs> they run around and they're wagging their tail. You wonder how that tail could even stick onto the butt's backside of the dog. <laughs> what you say is it was chewed, blissed out of her head. And as for Annapana, it disappeared a long time ago. Couldn't even see the breath. It was so still. Because on the top of meditation mountain, you don't just have insight. You don't have just stillness. You don't have just bliss. Incredible love and joy and ecstasy. All three coexist on the top of meditation mountain. That's my simile. When I first went to it, it was just about some seven five. I thought, oh, there's something missing there. The joy, the meta, the ecstasy. Because sometimes when people talk about meditation, Samatha Vipassana is as boring as hell. <laughs> Samatha Vipassana, just be still and go to sleep. Inside, just more things you argue with your friends about. And just, what is insight anyway? Because sometimes insight, it's just used as a tool to argue with others. I know what's right. You're wrong. My teacher says this. My teacher says that. There was this uh, story of the two monks. <coughs> Quite two monks because they both uh, uh, mess up. I won't say that. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> I usually laugh at my own jokes. <laughs> Other people don't find them funny, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so the two monks, you probably heard the first part many, many times. They were seeing a flag fluttering in the wind. One monk said, I've oh, seen that flag moving. The other monk said, No, the flag's not moving, the wind is moving. So they argued, and so they went to the, the Okay, the head monk, and he's the head monk, uh, so which one is right? And the head monk said, you're both wrong. The mind, the, the mind was moving. And the three of them weren't satisfied by that. So they went to the very, very wise bhikkhuni, who said, all three of you are wrong. Your mouths were moving. <laughs> and that's, that's the difference. <laughs> Even which other people don't see, who cares whether it's a mind moving, depending which way you look at it. But what really causes trouble in samsara is when you open up your mouth and you start talking. I have to open my mouth, that's my job. <laughs> <laughs> but if I didn't have to do it, I'd keep quiet. So, a lot of times people make a mistake of insights. Just pick one way of looking at things. Well, there's many others, many other ways. And also, that uh, they tend to open their mouths and create conflict. So sometimes it's nice just to be quiet. You may not agree with what's being said, but who cares? If you try and, and step in, just create more problems. Right? Just be quiet. So anyway, 
that uh, how insight actually works. Sometimes you can read a book, is that insight? It's just other people's insights. You can listen to a teacher, that's just my insights. What about your insights? And how do you know the insights? How do you know it's got it right? And the sign of insight is it should be liberating you from some suffering. You know it because it frees you. You feel it because there was a problem there and the problem has disappeared. Now especially that when we are on the path of meditation, it's very really clear what's inside and what isn't. In life it's much more difficult because so many other people are just going going in all sorts, of <coughs> all sorts of ways and we think, if we follow them it must be right because everyone is doing it. Just because everybody is doing the same doesn't mean it's insight and it's right and it's wisdom. Sometimes so many people doing something is not proof that it's a good thing to do. So one of the reasons why that you know, we have like monastics with our sins because we do you know, live outside the box, we do do things differently have a totally different lifestyle. And that means we can actually see something, like, you know, what is the cause of suffering? So there was uh, a person who went to see the doctor, and she said, you know, the doctor asked her, what's wrong with you? What's the symptom? She said, my whole body hurts. She said, whole body and every square inch of it. How come? She said, well, you know, I touch my head, that hurts. Touch my nose, that hurts. I touch my teeth, they hurt. I touch my chest, it hurts. I touch my knee, it hurts. Everything hurts. The doctor got insight and said it's because you've broken your finger. So <laughs> 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 um, now, that was an old joke which I read all the time about just adapted it, it's a really good, good way of describing just you know, why it's suffering. So anyway, you know if the suffering is ease, if the, the fear is let go of, if we can let go of our guilt or our trauma from the path which just really weighs us down, that's insight. So how we actually do this is we use a path of our meditation and so why can't we become still? First of all, why can't we relax our body? Why can't we go to sleep at night? Why? You've got lovely beds, no one is disturbing you. So why can't you go down and have a nice rest? So we investigate, we find out but what the reasons obviously is we find now here on the cushion, this is our laboratory, and we use whatever we find here in uh, our daily life. One of the reasons is because we want to go to sleep and we're afraid of what happens if we don't go to sleep. I mentioned this in brief before, but there came a time, oh, a couple of years ago, three or four years ago, I don't know why, but I was having difficulty going to sleep at night. <coughs> and I solved the problem by not wanting to go to sleep. I mentioned this, I think, in one of the talks earlier. Who wants to miss out on the comfort of laying in your bed, <laughs> stretching out and just, just you know, rubbing your, your bare shoulders on the linen, which is very, very nice, snuggling into your pillow. And here it may be cold or too hot. There it's just right. And also, um, it's quiet, no one's asking you any questions, it's sleep on there, no one's looking at you, so not sort of saying that your posture's wrong or your posture's right. It's you know, just no stress being in bed. And so I thought, wow, I, I, why do you want to waste this by going unconscious? I'm just going to really enjoy this. And of course you know what happened. <laughs> You know, next thing you need, we'll wake up in the morning. Or, one of our other monks, 
<laughs> he uh, learned how to go to sleep in noisy situations because his, uh, he told me that his brother wanted to come and stay. You know, he was a European monk. And there was no space in Bodhinyana Monastery. We were always very full. It doesn't matter, he can share my room. It's only a small room. You know, it's only about 3 meters by 2.4. Are you sure? He said, well, we go out together. You know, we shared rooms when we were young. No problem, he's my brother. He's not a monk. I'm a monk, he's a lay person. But, and I said, look at your age. You're going to snore, for sure. No people never think that they do the snoring, because they never notice it. They're asleep when it happens. So people say, I don't snore. <laughs> yeah, of course you do. <laughs> but he, re he recognized, yes, he will snore. And so, I said to him, well, what's your plan? You're going to be awake all night. He said, my plan is this, that when we go into the room, I will make sure I lay down first and fall asleep first. Because the one who falls asleep first never needs to be kept awake <laughs> by his own snoring. His brother did. So that was his plan, to fall asleep first. But then of course it never worked out that way. His brother fell asleep right away and snored like an elephant. <laughs> Not an ordinary elephant with four feet, the elephant called Jumbo Jets, <laughs> taking off from his throat. And such a noisy snore. And he thought, oh my goodness, I'm not going to have any sleep at all tonight. What should I do? And then he remembered all the teachings to practice insight, just to change the way you perceive that, uh, that sound. Not the noise disturbing you, it's you who's disturbing the noise. So stop disturbing the noise. What does that mean? So his insight became, he was a very refined monk, highly educated. He started to listen to that snoring and start to interpret it as some of the most groundbreaking modern forms of music. <laughs> Not restricted to the usual norms and constraints of melody and pitch. And he found after a while it did have a beat, it had a rhythm to it. Not your normal rhythm. So this was really sort of avant-garde, breaking all the rules of what music should be. It was really powerful, innovative, and after a few minutes, the snoring was actually sonorous. It was really worth listening to. It was you know, just something which, a new form of music, you know, which had yet to be invented. <coughs> and there he was, really sort of enjoying his brother's snoring. And of course, the next thing which happened, he woke up in the morning after a good night's sleep. He'd taken away the negativity to his situation. And when he took away the negativity, his body relaxed, allowing him to snore. Not enough to say it, he had to snore himself to fall asleep. But what it meant was he got the insight into why people can't sleep. They're trying too hard to sleep, and that makes the body tense. And the body's tense, it just cannot go to sleep. And it's a similar, the insight, you could take that insight into the cause of inattention, which stops you relaxing and being peaceful enough to go to sleep, to the same when you're meditating. When you're meditating, many people are so tense because I'm a monk, I've been meditating for many years, I'd better sit up straight. What if I just start slowing myself in the morning meditation? And you get a photograph of that, put it on the internet. Ha ha ha, I don't cry, it's not really good meditation, see, he falls asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and so sometimes people get tense because they're afraid of what other people will think of them. Already, you know, we have a cough going around. If you cough, just cough for goodness sake. It's allowable. Everybody does it. I do it. And all gender does it. So, you know, I'm sure the Buddha did it. So, just cough when it's time to cough. Otherwise, you hold it in. You get so tired, so tense. There's no peace. 
And of course, it's going to blow. <laughs> there you go. And of course, I have to do that because my insight, given talks, is a lot of time people fall asleep. And they have their eyes open because they do not want to offend me. But their mind is just wandering off into dreamland. So when I do the cough, cough, cough very loud, it, I'm sorry it disturbs you, but at least I'll get your attention once more. <laughs> and I'm basically paying attention, so that's good. So when you, force, uh, when you, you learn this, it's a simple insight which you can take over into your meditation. And also, some of the great insights on how to calm your body down to heal it. And a lot of times that people, when they start meditating, they think, oh, we're not really in it for jhanas or enlightenment, that's wonderful if it happens, but you've got other things which are more important, you know, your cancers, anxieties, arthritis, heart disease, some sort of disease, everyone's got some sort of disease somewhere. So, we always sort of like to meditate, first of all, to see if we can help with our diseases. And that's wonderful when you find you can. Some of these diseases which occur, it's not just uh, something which needs to be fixed by medication. There's other things which you can do yourself. Such as, uh, oh, look at the first simple example. It's one of the monks uh, in Australia. And he had um, a chronic back pain. And so he was meditating, he was trying to find the best posture, trying to find cushions or stools or even sit on a chair, but nothing worked. He was always in pain when he meditated after a few minutes. So he went to see his uh, GP who uh, let him have a CAT scan. And after he had a CAT scan, he found out that he had a genetic deformity of his spine. There was nothing they could do, surgery wouldn't work, nothing would work. And the specialist said, the only thing you can do is not meditate. That's like telling a cook you can't eat. That's like telling a gardener, you don't, know, don't prune the flowers. And this is his life, his love, and he had to meditate. So he was put in a difficult situation, so he, he turned away from the doctors, and just managed to find a little book, a long time ago, and it was just generally how he used mindfulness. What he did, he heard from this book, there were muscles on either side of your spine which you never use. You don't need to. You don't know they exist. So he was told with his hands, every morning for about 15 minutes, or even half an hour, to stroke those areas. To stroke them and pay attention to the stroking until he actually made what we know now in neurology and neuroscience a new connection. <coughs> so, a new connection with those muscles. So after about two or three months of doing this regularly every day, you can actually feel those muscles without even touch them. Just in the same way you can actually feel your nose, you can feel your bottom, I can feel my legs. Don't need to touch them. I just I can just put my attention down there and I know where they are, what they're doing and how they feel. So he could do that with those muscles on the other side of his spine. And the next job, the next task, exercise, was to learn how to move those muscles. And how do you do that? And it's just trial and error. Sometimes imagining them moving and then see if they do move. And after another two or three months, he could actually move them. The mindfulness gave him feedback. Just the same way a child learns how to walk or if you're unfortunate enough to have some accident uh, or trauma or coma, you have to learn again by becoming aware of your muscles and just learning how to move them again. A lot of time it is just trying to learn until it works. And that's what he did with the muscles. And once he could actually move them, the next part was to, ex <coughs> sorry, to exercise them every day. They're going out to exercise and stretch and relax and stretch and relax and stretch and relax them. Just to say you can learn to exercise, you know, your arms or your legs by going on a walk. And so now those muscles are so strong, much stronger than the equivalent muscles on either side of my back. 
so they compensate for the weakness in his spine. So there's no more pain. He can meditate. Problem solved. There are lots of things you can do with your own body. Another girl, she called me, she was bedridden in Adelaide University. And the reason she was bedridden, she had chronic anxiety. So chronic, so severe, despite all the attempts of the GPs, the psychologists, psychiatrists, in that university, all helping her for free, she was too afraid to get out of bed and go to the door, and go outside. And no one could help her. So, who comes to the rescue? The Seventh Cavalry from Perth. Da da da, Raja Bam. And his monks. <laughs> That's what it felt like. So she called me from her bed. And she said, because her uncle was a strong supporter of ours. And uh, she said, no, what's wrong? He said, chronic anxiety, I can't get out of bed. And I said, well, when you have anxiety, where do you feel it in your body? Because every emotional, especially strong emotional states, have a corresponding feeling in your body. And so you now I had that insight a long time ago that if you're angry, you can feel it somewhere. And it's a different feeling when if you're in love, or if you're afraid, or if you are tired. That's not really an emotion, or if you're elated, but you can actually feel it on your body somewhere. And the feelings and sensations are different. So, so when you have an anxiety, where do you feel it on the body? I said, well, it's sort of in my chest. Not good enough. I want coordinates from your navel, from your belly button, centimetres and millimetres up to the left or to the right. And I want to describe it, just how big is it? Is it a circle? Is it just fade away quickly? How much of your chest does it cover? Give me a call within three days. One of the things we know with healing your own sicknesses is to take some responsibility for the process of healing. So it's not you just relying on somebody else, which is very, very, um, uh, what's the word? Um, disempowering. Sorry? Disempowering. Disempowering, excellent. That's why I have you here. <laughs> so you don't feel disempowered too. <laughs> So she felt disempowered and being humiliated, she could do nothing for herself. So that, that was her job. Two or three days later, she called and she said, yeah, it's about six or seven inches, uh, uh, 6.6 .6 centimetres up from my navel or something. The centre is actually to my left. It's actually not in the centre of my chest. It's a little bit to that. It's like an oval, sort of this much in uh, length, this much width. And that's sort of, you know, where it's located. And that's a really good description. She's a really smart girl. And then I asked her, what does it feel like? Describe it. Said, it's just tense. Not good enough. I want a detailed description. Not just it's tense, but does it start on tense? Does it ebb and flow? Does it increase? Or does it get less? Describe it to me in detail. And so I was giving her more things to do. And so two or three days later she called again and she described it as like a, a couple of page essay on how it feels to be anxious on her chest. It was actually brilliant, much more than I expected. But I said, well done, now you're mindful of that feeling. It's not just it hurts. You know, you've got a full mindfulness of that. You really investigate and got to know it. Instead of being afraid of it, trying to run away, you really got into it, being able to describe it to somebody on the phone, you know, a couple of thousand kilometres away, and a really good description. Now you're aware, the next thing to do is practice the kindness, the metta. So, when you have an anxiety attack, you can feel that anxiety in your chest, take your hand and massage it. With a lot of kindness. And as she was very fortunate that she had her boyfriend, Lloyd. And uh, he was helping her every day, do the washing and cooking and everything for her. So lucky to have a, a guy like that. They said, look, Lloyd does so much for you anyway. If you feel just too weak 
to do the massage yourself. I know boys. Ask him to do it. I'm sure he'll be very happy to massage his uh, girlfriend's chest. But tell him to do it just really with lots of kindness. And give him a call in three days. Yeah. Three days later, so what happened when you had a clarity attack you massaged that area? So I felt the sensations, the, the, the tension, the, the ache, the throb, I, I felt it just get less and less and less until it, the physical feeling, the physical counterpart to the anxiety, just disappeared. Great, I said. And when the physical counterpart, the tightness tension in your chest disappeared, what happened to your anxiety? The eureka moment. The light bulb. I didn't, I couldn't see her, but she paused. And it was a wonderful moment when someone gets it. The anxiety went too. Marvellous. Now you know what to do. Goodbye. <laughs> and I hung up. <laughs> a busy mother with a lot of things to do. <laughs> But a couple of weeks later, she was out of bed, back in university, back to lectures. She had got a first class with honours in dentistry. And then six months later, she came to Perth with her boyfriend, Lloyd, to get me to chart for their wedding. And that was a beautiful thing. I could save her life, and push her life forward to the next stage. She was bedridden, and now she was happily married. She's got a couple of kids now, always come to check in and say hello. So, this is insight <coughs> and things which actually affect your body. So if you have anxiety, if you have fear before giving a public talk, if you get a tense or something before a driver's test, where is it in your body? Somewhere here. Find it. Do a nice massage, really sensuous, kind. Oh, that's nice. When the feeling goes, so does the cause of the feeling. Or oh, it's a it's, uh, counterpart, the physical problem. So if ever you do see people who, who go into examinations rather their chest, you know where they've got that one from. The same as sometimes that when people go into a doctor, sometimes when people go and visit doctors, why do people not visit doctors on time? One of the reasons is not because of the fear of the diagnosis, or you've got cancer, you're going to die or whatever, but sometimes we feel embarrassed to go to a doctor because what do you do when you go and see a GP? You say, Doctor, there's something wrong with me. I've got an ache of pain here, or I've got sort of, uh, a tension in my right chest, it must be a heart attack. Or oh, he's got throbbing, that must be an aneurysm. Or oh, is I've got just this fever, it must be Ebola. <sighs> or whatever. <coughs> Why do we always say there's something wrong with me? I'm sick. It's stigmatizing st sickness. And I got that insight when I was, uh, I forget it, I don't even know what it was, but I got really low energy for a week. Felt very, very, nothing, no energy at all. I didn't know what it was. So I went to see the doctor, and sitting in there, just waiting to die, or see the doctor, whichever one came first, and it would be a close call. <laughs> and then, because I was visiting prisons and teaching prisoners how to meditate, one of the prison officers came in, took one look at me, and said, Wow, I never expected to see you in here. Because meditators are supposed to be healthy. And I felt so guilty as if he'd call me in a pub <laughs> or in a casino or in a brothel or something. <laughs> and Mark should be, should get sick. <laughs> That's what I thought. I sort of, a lot of times people, they take their health as uh, their pride. And to be sick, there's something wrong with you, you're getting sick. That's one of the reasons stigmatizing sickness means people don't go and see GPs. So, don't stigmatize it. So I teach many, many people these days 
and if you feel a bit poorly, just go and see the GP. But introduce yourself, say, Doctor, there is something right with me. I'm sick again. What's wrong with being sick? It's not against precepts, it just happens, everyone gets sick. So, take away the stigma, there's something right. And straight away, instead of trying to escape from it, you investigate it, you're with it. One of the most tough monks I've known in Thailand was a monk called Ajahn Mahabua. He was a teacher of the king of Thailand, previous king of Thailand. He was as tough as anything, to the point that one evening he did have a heart attack, severe heart attack, and there's no um, person to call, there's no um, telephones or something. He just meditated all night. And when a doctor came in the morning, it was a Chinese doctor, who felt all the pulses you know, in his wrist, I think seven pulses, eight pulses I get now. And anyway, the, all the pulses, the Chinese doctor, very expert on Chinese medicine, said, they're all telling me you're dead. But obviously you're not. And he used his incredible willpower just to keep going, keep alive. Very powerful monk. But when I went to see him once, he told me the story. I don't know why he told me this, because he was saying to me, never do things like that. Because when he was practicing with his teacher called Ajahn Man, the same teacher for Ajahn Chah, he said he had malaria fever. He was in his hut, <coughs> sweating, fever, feeling terrible. But then the bell went for the chores in the afternoon. And despite he was <coughs> right in the middle of a, of a malaria fever, he got up from his bed, dressed, went down the stairs of his hut, picked up a broom and started sweeping the grounds like everybody else did, even though he was right in the middle of an attack of malaria fever. And Ajahn saw him and just told him, you are stupid, do not do that. That's not the way of a Buddhist monk. Go back up to your room, lay down and investigate. Get to know what the fever is, but don't fight it. I remember him telling me that, and telling all the other monks at that particular talk, so I was only visiting, that was for that Western monk over there, me. I already knew the Thai very, very well, but it made an impression on me that sicknesses and everything else, if you fight it, it gets worse. So instead we use what we call wisdom power to understand these sicknesses. And the classic story of insight, and it's been used in so many places, I even saw it on YouTube, somebody else was teaching this, but I don't care as long as it works, it's better than around. Was the anger eating monster story? I told it already, angry monster. No. The anger eating monster story. So once, once many, many years ago, there was an empress who was really into practicing Buddhism and going to the temples to listen to the talks. So one evening she went to the Bhikkhuni monastery to listen to a talk by this amazing Bhikkhuni. And, <laughs> and when the talk was finished, she went back to her palace. And while she was away, this monster had come. This demon, this ugly, smelly, violent, terrifying monster. And all, you know, being an empress, you know, that she had guards and security and cameras and everything. And as soon as the, 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 the uh, monster came in, what did the security do? They hid. They were under the tables, in the broom cupboards, behind the pot plants, anything. Because they were terrified. They never seen anything so ugly and frightening as this monster. All these soldiers and armed guards, who oh, they also ran. Because this was one scary monster. Apparently, 
I'm going to see this. But the most scariest of monsters in the, TV, in the movies is Alien. Is that right? But anyway, this monster made Alien look like a little pussycat. <laughs> a kitten, all fluffy and nice. This was one mean dude monster. <laughs> <coughs> and that made, allowed the monster to go right into the palace, sit on the Empress's own throne. Said, okay, I'll take over this palace from now on, said the monster. And at that, sitting in the Empress's chair, that's when the security, the guards, the ministers, the soldiers came to their senses and they kind of know this is going too far. They never attacked the monster, they threatened it. Get out of there! You don't belong. Out! Now! Now! You'll be in big trouble if you don't get out now. And every unkind word, every unkind, malicious, violent threat, even unkind <coughs> thoughts, the monster grew an inch bigger, more ugly, more violent, and more smelly. When the Empress came back after a wonderful talk, this monster was absolutely huge. It was just so gross, so scary. So the language was just foul mouth monster. And the smell, the stench coming off this monster's body, like it hadn't washed for, for an eon. It was so bad that even the maggots that were crawling over the monster's skin, they threw up. <laughs> it even made maggots vomit. <laughs> but the Empress came in and said, Oh, welcome. Thank you so much for giving me a visit. Why have you wasted so much time uh, before you popped in? And anyway, by the way, has anyone got you a cup of tea yet? We've got many, many types of tea in this palace. You know, we've got Sri Lankan tea with tin kiwi. We have, you can ask the Sri Lankans what tin kiwi means. We have peppermint tea, it's good for your health. We have um, Earl Grey, you know, the kiwis love Earl Grey apparently. We have uh, coffee, we have fair trade coffee, we have uh, free range coffee. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just so, uh, what coffee do you want? And, you know, we can have sort of uh, latte or uh, locus skim milk or no milk or almond milk or this milk. What would you like? We've got something to eat with that. And it was actually not a joke of sincere kindness. And every kind word or kind deed, the monster grew an inch more. Less ugly, less smelly. And the maggots stopped being smelly. <coughs> and less, less aggressive. And that was when all the guards and security and ministers realised their mistake. So they started being kind to the monster. Some of them went to its feet to give it a foot massage. Have you ever had reflexology? Foot massage. It's so rare for a monster to have his feet massaged. And they were so big, it took about 20 of the ministers to get around one foot to actually to massage it. And this monster is just, being, just a bit over there. Just, oh, 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 yeah, oh, that's good. <laughs> I have something to eat. So what do you, what do you feed a monster? And some of them get, yes, monster-sized pizza. Because if you go for a pizza takeaway, you get monster-sized apparently. You get monster-sized for Pizza Hut in, in um, England. Anyway, you do it in Australia. So you've got monster-sized pizza for a monster. And then, <laughs> every kind act, kind word, kind deed, Kind of thought so. The monster kept shrinking, 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 shrinking. Until it was the same size when it first came into the palace, they kept on being kind, 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 kind. Until the monster was so tiny 
one more act of kindness <coughs> and the monster vanished completely away. And that was told in the Do, oh, so the Yaka Samyutta. And that was in the Samyutta Nikaya. But I added the stuff about the pizzas <laughs> and the <top> of stuff <laughs> and the baguettes. <laughs> So that's what the story should be. Keep the essence of it, but just make it interesting. I call the angry eating monster story. I remember reading that, I thought, wow, there's so many angry eating monsters in life. Get out of here, you don't belong. And what happens? They get worse. Mr. Trump, get out of the White House. And it gets worse. Interesting observation. <laughs> <laughs> or any disease you have. Tumor. Get out of my dress. You don't belong. You're sitting in my throne, in my body. Get out now. This is not a joke anymore. This is important stuff. Welcome, Tumor. Thank you for visiting. There's enough room in my body for both of us. And the stand of the tuna increasing with every act of kindness, it gets smaller. What do we feed it? Aggression. We feed it fear. We feed it oh, um, anger. That's it, and the written monster. So, for one of our retreats, this fellow came in for a nine day retreat within Sydney. And the very first day, I had so many questions in the basket. Will you please ask meditators not to breathe so loudly? <laughs> <sighs> <sighs> At which point I said that that gentleman has got a huge tumour in his sinuses. His oncologist has given up on him. There's no possible treatment left. He's got maybe a couple of weeks or months to go before he dies. He's come to this retreat with my permission just to see if meditation would help him. As soon as you explain why people do what they do, there was no complaints anymore. There was this huge compassion and kindness because this fellow was almost at the end of his life and they were just, the compassion of meditators kicked in. And it wasn't just get out of here, can we make him sort of meditate in another room somewhere, not disturbing us? And other people were meditating, getting so much compassion and kindness for this fellow, and that helped a lot of meditation. And so anyway, at the end of the retreat, Always. The very last meditation. Sometimes I think we should just end the meditation today so you can get to the last meditation when things happen. <laughs> I don't know why this is. The last meditation. He came running to me afterwards and said, Ajabra, I must tell you something. I was meditating and I heard a pop, a popping sound. I could breathe through my nose. I could actually breathe. It lasted for one minute and it closed up again. But at least something happened. And the big tumour happened. <coughs> I may have to be for weeks, for months maybe, I don't know. But the tumour retreated. And it wasn't a I didn't need a CT scan to notice this. You could feel it. There was air going through his nose again. And it closed up. And I must in me, I thought the fellow had left it too late. Like doing your, your studies the night before the exam, not doing any other work all year. But, these stories always have a happy ending. About a year later, I was in Sydney again, doing <coughs> another talk, another place. And this gentleman came up, do you remember me? Please do not do that to me. I travel many places and some talks to 3,000, 5,000 people, sometimes 10,000. I said, oh, I saw you in Sri Lanka in BMICH. 
Give me 10,000 people there, please. <laughs> so these days, I've got this from a comic, and it's very nice. I don't know if that happens to you. You know, you know it's somebody important, or somebody you should remember, and they come up to you and say, do you remember me? The best reply is, oh yeah, you're the person whose name I keep forgetting. <laughs> Get you out of the life. This guy said, I don't know, who the hell are you? And he said, I was that guy. I carried on meditating. The tumor got smaller and smaller and smaller and disappeared. I'm in full remission. Thank you so much. That's why I came here to see you, he said. And I'm spending the rest of my life, wherever I can, wherever I can, teaching other people how to do this. That's one of the best rewards you can ever get. When someone says thank you like that, and they don't do more than thank you, they don't sort of give you or serve you or anything, they go off and teach that to someone else. So, if someone gives you a gift and you give it back, finish. So, as your child told me, whatever I've given you, I've done, don't say thank you. If I've taught you, helped you, you're in debt to me, said as your child. The only way to pay off that debt is to help others. And tell other people, if I've helped you, you're a debt to me. The only way that you can pay off that debt is to help someone else. That way it goes on and on and on and on and on. Never stops. It's a beautiful teaching from Ajahn Chah. But anyway, so it's amazing. How does this work? You get the insights into the cause of sickness, the tightness of tension. You can feel it yourself in your own body. The tightness of tension inside. If you keep that going for too long, it's something going to break and get sick. It's beautiful kindness. As soon as you have this kindness, and that's why in the beginning of meditation, mindfulness of the body, and then how to relax it. Feel a little bit of tightness there, focus on it, don't be afraid of it. And just welcome tightness, welcome pain, welcome um, irritable bowel. And little by little you get to love it and care for it. It becomes your friend, not your enemy. And then it's just no problem at all. You can't beat them, join them. So anyway, you do that with your body. You're learning great insights in how to calm pain and suffering. Insight into how to calm things. And of course, then you do it with your mind. Do you mind? How, how can I calm this mind? Why do I think so much? When you know most of the thoughts, just rubbish. Why do you do that? This is, this is where I think I already mentioned this to you, that I looked at myself years ago and said, every time I was taught, watch your breath. And if your breath wanders off, bring it back again. No, gently, don't scold it. And it wandered off again, bring it back again. Wandered off again, bring it back again. Wandered off again, bring it back again. Wandered off again. That went on for years. It didn't work. It was frustrating. And then after a while, I said, why? Why does my mind want to wander off? Would you like to know wander off in this retreat? <coughs> if you do, it's because you're not enjoying yourself here. You'd like to walk out of this talk. If the talk is really useful and engaging, you would never want to walk out of this talk. This is the reason why the mind wanders off. You're not engaging with it. You're controlling it. And it's afraid of you. You're abusing your mind. That's why he will try and run off for the first opportunity. I'm not good enough. I, I can't meditate. I oh, know this is terrible. And be kind, give your mind a break. And say, this is good enough, mind. You just watched a breath, one breath today. Well done, good on you. You're getting there. Instead of saying, you're hopeless. Mind, you can't meditate. You're supposed to be meditating. Be kind to your mind. Treat it with respect. And give it a chance. And you'll find that, you know, sometimes there's there's coaches, there's trainers, there's teachers. Some of my best teachers, they were just so encouraging. And that's what I needed to, to, <coughs> to do.
to do well, not force and fear, but encouragement and kindness, feeling that somebody knows for me rather than against me. And if you act like that to your own mind, or even like to your breath, heart breath, you've served me so well over all these years, breathing in and breathing out, sometimes when I've been sick or sleeping, but you've always done your job, breath. Thank you so much. And obviously you know how to breathe, you've been doing it for such a long time, 67 years my breath has been going in and out, hasn't let me down once, and I want to control it and tell it what to do. Breathe it this way, breathe it out that way. I'm really dumb, disrespectful. So, okay, breath, you do what you need to do, you do it well. So I'll just sit down there and just watch my breath. My breath does exactly the right speed, the right amount of air. So if it stops breathing, fine, you know what you're doing. You haven't let me down yet, just I don't need to breathe for a few seconds because enough oxygen. Fine, I trust you, breath. Or if you're breathing in a lot, I don't know why you're doing that, but you know what you're doing, off you go. So you trust your breath, you respect your breath, you become a friend to your breath. So sometimes if you do do breath meditation, use the insight, there's a lot of kindness. Are you really respecting your breath and even loving your breath? So sometimes I imagine my breath and me holding it. Just holding it you know, hand to hand and just walking on our walk together. Best friends, enjoying each other's company. Not so telling them what to do, what they're doing wrong, or what they're doing right, but just being best of friends. I want to have that attitude to my best as friendliness or best of friends. I don't wander off at all. We're best mates. We've known each other for such a long time. We trust each other. So we enjoy each other's company and the mind doesn't need to wander off anywhere. It doesn't run away. Why would it? When you're with a good friend. That is the insight into how to stop the wandering mind. Kindness, friendliness. Don't treat your mind or anything like a slave. You better watch. Stay with me for, for three minutes, Beth. Okay, you better Meditation retreat is almost halfway through, or over half I don't know. You better behave from now on, okay? No more messing around, okay? Otherwise, no lunch for you today. <laughs> Good. <laughs> of course, if you do things like that, you'll, you might have found someone to escape. So instead, you're kind. And you stay with the breath. You're getting some insight into how to be healthy. How to be peaceful, not frightening, but encouraging. And little by little, the mind stops more and more and more. And when it gets into deeper meditation, it's already mentioned, it gets beautiful. Why are people afraid of happiness? <coughs> that is one of the weirdest insights. You think that when bliss comes, that you'll take it. It's free. There's no health, uh, health dangers to it. It cannot be taxed. The government hasn't found a way yet to tax bliss. <laughs> <laughs> so it's peaceful, free, so healthy, no dangers at all. You don't need anybody or anything to actually to get the bliss up. It's just there for you, whenever you want it. It's just a good deal. So why are people not watching it. Number one is because they think they don't deserve it. It's a terrible sense of self, which is so fault-finding. That's where you get that inside of the two bad bricks in a wall. Why was it when I made my first wall, there's only two bricks which were crooked, why was it that I just focused on the two bad ones? I had nightmares about them. I wanted to destroy the wall just because of the two silly bricks. There's 998 good bricks. I used that story about a month, about a year or so after I made that wall when I was giving a talk in a uh, university in uh, Kuala Lumpur. And at that, that uh, talk, question time, there's some great questions. The question was from a, one of the lecturers, uh, 
uh, a nice woman. And she said, <coughs> this morning I found my husband had lied to me. I can't trust him anymore. Our trust has been shattered. Should I get divorced? Pretty tough question to ask a monk, should I get divorced? <laughs> but anyway, I handled it successfully, which is why I tell you the story. The times when I don't do it successfully, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> it's not inspiring. <laughs> so anyway, what I told was that, oh crikey, already nice. Here. So I'll finish soon. Be part two inside tomorrow. So I told her that, now what are you doing in the university? And she says she was a lecturer in maths. How long have you been married with this guy? She said, three years. Let's do some statistics and probability theory. Three years, let's call it a thousand days. Let's, for the sake of this item, I think it's a reasonable assumption, that over the three years of your marriage, your husband has said things to you, maybe 30 statements a day, on average, which could be right, which could be wrong. So since you were married, he's made 30,000 right or wrong statements. Now this morning you found he was lying. So probability theory shows that the next time your husband opens his mouth, on past records, there's a 29,999 to 1 chance that he's telling the truth. That's pretty trustworthy to me. If you get any politician, any salesman, especially used car salesman, to 29,999 to 1 chance he's telling the truth, I'd buy that car. Pretty, mm -hmm. pretty honest, pretty viable. So why is it that you he lied once and you think he's a liar? Fascinating, isn't it? Why we always focus on mistakes and faults instead of focusing on the other half of life. Not the other half of life. The other 90 percent, 99, 99.9999% of life. So, so oh, that's a double way of looking at it. So I think they're still married. Yay! <laughs> so, these are insights. So why is it that when happiness comes, we want to destroy it? We tend to destroy it. We don't sort of, you know, just see that one bad brick in the wall, two bad bricks in the wall, three bad bricks in the wall. It doesn't matter, there's so many good bricks in here. So I allow yourself to be happy. Why not? I'm not a perfect monk, but I'm certainly happy enough. A long time ago, your happiness is a choice that you can make. Oh, up to you, what do you want to, what do you want to choose? But I get attached. Oh, stop finding faults. So, so it's not true either. You don't get attached to happiness. People get attached to suffering. It's amazing how people get attached to suffering and guilt. They become Mr. Guilt, Mrs. Guilt, Mrs. Grief. I remember this lady once. She was the, uh, the mother of one of these um, victims of serial killers. I'm going to stop one day. <laughs> <laughs> and I was giving a sort of a seminar on how to deal with guilt. And I gave a really sort of good um, technique of how to overcome uh, grief. And that really pissed her off. I made her angry. She came right up to me afterwards, nose to nose. How dare you try to take away my grief? She said. That was amazing. That I obviously got close and uh, given her a path, but she rejected that. She would rather have grief because she got so many benefits from being a famous grieving mother. Oh, you poor thing. And having your daughter killed by a serial killer, her body not found. 
you're not sort of saying that her situation was was some which you would choose, but there it was as a way out that she would take it. Sometimes we are attached, literally, we identify with our grief, with our pain. And to give it up, to let it go, even though the possibility is there, it's a choice, but no, that's not who we are. We have to change our persona. Anyway, more coming tomorrow with Insight Part 2, where we go even deeper into the powerful insights which turn you inside out and upside down and totally destroy who you thought you were. So you find that out tomorrow in the meditation hall close to you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs>